Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm James Horvath, your 2021 president for the AIA's Las Vegas chapter. It's been my pleasure to introduce each of our committees this year as we focused on their purposes and highlighted their ongoing work. This month, we have a presentation that has been put together by the Affordable Housing Committee for AIA Las Vegas. Before I get to the introductions of the committee chair, I'd first like to say a few thank yous for our evening sponsors. Tonight is brought to our members through the sponsorship of our visionary sponsors. They are Knit Studios, Nevada Sales Agency, the Pensa Building Group, and Clyde Jeeble Wald, as well as our platinum sponsors, Harris Consulting Engineers, TJK Consulting Engineers, Bergman Walls and Associates, and Grand Canyon Development Partners. The Affordable Housing Committee is chaired by Monica Gresser, their purpose has been to collaborate with civic entities and community leaders to find solutions to make housing more affordable in Las Vegas. At this time, I'd like to turn over the presentation to Monica so she can introduce tonight's panelists. Uh, thank you. I uh, seem to be having some technical difficulties, even though we just spent like 10 minutes going through it. Um, so pardon me for a moment while I find um, the information that I'm looking for. Um, so tonight what we're talking about, oh my goodness, yes, Carlos just said, please don't uh, have your text open, but that is going to be an issue for me apparently. Um, so tonight what we're talking about is affordable housing. I'm looking for my information. Please bear with me for just a moment. I'm so sorry. So much for me breaking in on you there, James. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let me go steal. Here we go. All right, got it. I think we're good. All right. Do you guys see my, um, do you see my screen? Do you see my affordable housing? Right on. Thank you, Tori, Keith. Okay. All right, so thank you. Uh, welcome. welcome to tonight's meeting. I appreciate um, the introduction. Um, just a brief um, overview about tonight's meeting is collaborating for people, removing obstacles in affordable housing. Um, so a quick plug, if you haven't already registered, it might not be too late to sign up for the annual housing conference, which is next week on Wednesday and Thursday. And we can share a link in the chat a little bit later um, uh, in this uh, discussion. So some other housekeeping items. Our plan is to talk a little bit more casually about the barriers in affordable housing. So please submit your questions in the chat. Uh, if you're a little shy, click on the question icon and send me a private uh, question. Please do not text me because apparently my computer is picking up everything tonight. Um, first, I'll introdu introduce, introduce each speaker. Then I'll give you a little, a little five to 10 minute spiel about what they do. Um, and what they've seen as barriers. Uh, and then they might even offer a possible solution for getting around those barriers or what we could do if we're not already doing that. So after that, we'll go into a little bit more conversational Q&A and we'll integrate your questions or comments in that part of it. If you don't know much about the AIA Las Vegas Affordable Housing Committee, here's a quick snapshot. The committee be began as the chapter explored affordable housing in a day-long charrette um, back in 2019. Here are a few photos from that time. Um, you can see a few of the teams working on some, some of the projects. Um, there were five teams that developed the information and then we presented it to the public a couple of months later. Here are a few of the images that you can see there. Um, and then, you know, from the time we um, did the charrette in August to the time we started doing these presentations in October, we realized that we did not have a full understanding of how all the funding go comes together um, and that there are a lot of barriers to, um, to how, how this all gets developed. So, and some of that has to do with funding and timing of funding. So today it really doesn't help that real estate costs a fortune and so that's even hindering um, the cost a little bit, you know, even more. 
Um, so, and I remember attending um, an early Nevada Housing Coalition meeting at, at the center maybe four years ago where I heard David Paul from Nevada Hand share har his harrowing statistics surrounding affordable housing. He said that we were so far behind in constructing affordable low-income housing that it would take Nevada Hand 200 years to catch up to the current demand. And then in 200 years, they'd be behind again. So that seems to be the case for pretty much everyone right now. Um, so let me introduce our speakers real quick. Uh, oh, sorry, let me go back a little bit. So typically when we think about low income wage earners as the people who are the people who need affordable housing, um, there are a lot of people, maybe we don't even think about who that might be, like wait staff, home health care workers, salespeople, janitors, laborers, cashiers, fast food workers, you know, and then we think about other people who are median income earners, which might be um, school teacher, teachers, bookkeepers, secretaries, nurses, and seniors. Um, and then there are those um, who have an even uh, less of an income due to illness, maybe an injury, mental health, seniors on fixed incomes. Um, and there are a lot of our fellow Nevadans who are less than a paycheck away from becoming homeless at any one time. And that's why we should really worry about um, affordable housing and how um, we can help um, how we can help figure out um, the solutions to creating more of that. So some of the issues to um, or the barriers to developing affordable single family and multifamily housing aren't necessarily solvable with the design build community. And so we've looked for um, we've looked for some new ways to. Um, to accommodate that, right? But we don't always find those. And so it, we're looking at renovating existing structures even, um, but the barriers to affordable housing still remain and they are outside of our normal work for, as architects. Um, but barriers to affordable housing can be changed, right? So we're looking for some of that. And, and even, um, you know, uh, uh, there, so these are outside of our normal work and they make it more difficult to develop housing faster. That's where I was going with this. Um, and so some of these issues can be sprinkled with policy, funding mechanisms, stereotyping. Um, and so really that makes it a less um, attractive, I guess, for investment. So who wants to um, invest in affordable housing? So tonight's panel will talk a little bit about dignity in housing, the built-in bureaucracy, and a, maybe even we'll touch a bit on um, code, sort of. Um, and the larger question from the housing committee has been about how do we become part of this, the solution and where do we become, where do we go to be part of that solution? So tonight we have Christine Hess, who is the director, executive director from the, the Nevada Housing Coalition, uh, Brooke Page, um, the director for the Southwest for CSH, Hillary Lopez, from the Praxis Consulting Group and Lori Murphy, VP of Real Estate Development for Ovation, Ovation Development. Christine, we're gonna kick it off with you um, and talk about barriers to housing and how it all comes together. Awesome, thank you so much, Monica. And thank you architects and everybody else in the audience for giving some of your evening attention to this super important topic of affordable housing. Uh, as Monica mentioned, I am the executive director for the Nevada Housing Coalition. We are a statewide nonprofit um, that works to advance and promote affordable housing for all Nevadans. And we do our work through education, collaboration, and advocacy. So I really appreciate your time tonight and we'll look for your feedback and be listening for your comments and questions because that really helps inform and guide the work that the coalition does because you're also part of our solution. So uh, in nearly every conversation I enter, I hear, we need more affordable housing. So I really, I enter these meetings and I'm like, oh, I feel a lot of pressure, but I don't build it. <laughs> You're closer to the building of it than I am. Um, but the fact of the matter is we are, have a severe shortage. I'm gonna focus on where our most extreme shortage is, which is for our most vulnerable Nevadans. The National Low Income Housing Coalition estimates that we have a shortage of over 105,000 units of affordable rental housing that is available and affordable to um, 
income levels, households with income levels below 50, uh, 50% of area median income. So what this means when, and I'm fairly new to affordable housing, I'm still gonna pull that new card. I've been in about a year and a half, but when I heard that, I was like 105,000 units, sure. Like all these people don't have a home. No, Christine, that's not what that means. What it does mean though, is they're at high risk of homelessness. That many families are paying more than 30% of their, their income, their household income on their housing costs. And many of them are paying more than half, which means they're not taking care of their health costs. They can't necessarily pay for transportation or it's difficult, that one car breakdown away. So this is definitely a business problem for Nevada. Um, additionally, education. The things that come along to make education function well aren't happening too. Let's think about all the kids during the pandemic where their parents couldn't afford a device or they didn't have access to broadband because they couldn't afford internet. So all of these things, housing impacts all of them. So it's really central to everything. And I think why, it's why we all in Nevada have to be part of the conversation. So I do wanna say, you know, the pandemic has definitely exacerbated the housing crisis. People are suffering even today as we sit here tonight and have this conversation. But Nevada's housing crisis started long before the pandemic. So that said, tonight I'm not gonna focus so much on our crisis. The coalition is definitely solutions oriented and I think we are have a lot of opportunities right now to make some real change for affordable housing. Unfortunately, there's no silver bullet for affordable housing, but that's also the good news. So it means there's a lot of ways we can impact affordable housing shortage by increasing access to the housing we do have and even increasing our supply. The solutions are gonna be policy focused, education focused and resource dependent. Affordable housing finance is complex and expensive. That's why we have Lori and Hillary here tonight and Brooke <laughs> to talk a little bit more about some of the ins and outs of how we can make it happen. But the good news is, is we can all do this together. The solutions are going to involve multiple players. They're gonna involve local, state, and federal elected officials, Nevada Housing Division, our state agency, our local government, city and county staff, of course, public housing authorities, cross-sector partners, including health, education, economic development, and you know, really the private sector. And when I say the private sector, that includes all of us here in this conversation today. You have a role in our affordable housing crisis too. So I wanna just share um, a couple highlights and I'm not gonna take too long and we can go into details and I can drop links in the chat as well um, that are examples of how the coalition works. This 2021 legislative session, the Housing Coalition led efforts on five bills. Um, our platform for the session or our priorities for the session fell into two buckets, production, so we need more affordable housing and access, equity and access. Just because we have affordable housing, it doesn't help if we can't access it. Um, we did pass two bills, SB 12 and SB 284. SB 12 is hugely important. And Carlos, I believe AIA actually supported our SB 12 too, the preservation bill. That one had a lot of support, thank you very much, um, and really sailed through both the assembly and the Senate. That bill is to provide 12 month notification. Um, all affordable housing de developers are required or owners are required to provide 12 months notification if their property is going to expire or terminate the affordability restrictions on that property. And they have to provide that notification to the state who in turn notifies affordable housing developers who might be mission driven and want to help save that housing. Um, it also notifies local governments and it also notifies the tenants. So we have 7,500 units in just the next few years that are at high risk of going to market. In Clark, 5,500 of those 7,500 units are right here in Clark County. So um, it's a big deal, preservation. And if you look at our um, overall net increase of affordable housing the past 10 years, um, we've basically flat, flatlined we're not really increasing our production because we're losing units as fast as we produce them. So the preservation bill was hugely important. Additionally, SB 284, both these bills were carried by Senator Ratty um, and the Housing Advisory Committee actually sponsored one of them. 
but um, SB 284 made fixes to our state tax credit, and we're really excited to um, launch that program with these fixes in place, and that's going to be a topic of conversation actually at our housing conference. Um, I'm not going to dwell too much on the uh, three bills that didn't pass, but what I will say is we were trying to enable some new tools, and while they didn't pass, it was an awesome opportunity for me to meet some more private sector friends. Um, builders and developers weren't too excited to see another potential impact be, but the fact of the matter is we need more affordable housing, and um, our local governments don't necessarily have all the tools and resources to do that. So. Um, AB331 and AB334 look to enable some tools. Um, so the next part I'm going to talk about would be our ARPA recommendations. And um, I'll also pop this link in the chat. But what I tell you is we put together a group of about 70 stakeholders and the Nevada Housing Coalition and a task force of these 70 stakeholders and board of directors have recommended to the state that we invest $500 million of our American Rescue Plan funds in affordable housing. And we split that into four buckets, uh, multifamily, uh, affordable home ownership, preservation, and land. What's also interesting in the multifamily, and it'll be a nice segue into Brooke's comments too, because the task force did also prioritize some of the hardest to build affordable housing. Within affordable housing, it's expensive, but within affordable housing, supportive housing, permanent supportive housing, and housing for um, incomes below 30% area median income are our hardest to build. So we've prioritized those even within our recommendation and designated and asked to designate certain funding amounts for that. So I'm gonna, Monica, I'll go ahead and drop it in the link, um, some of those resources but, and I think we'll do questions after, right? We will, thank you. I appreciate that, Christine. So, so as Christine mentioned, you know, we, uh, we did look at, uh, in, in the task force, we looked at uh, some of the um, most vulnerable people as well, because if we, one of the things we risk doing is um, the lower your income or the more your income is zero, the more we risk you becoming homeless. And if you become homeless, it becomes more difficult to, um, to, for you to contribute to um, to the to just society in general, um, it also becomes more difficult for everyone else, and because we're worried about how how we all live and work, right? So, so some of what um, Brooke has been looking at are um, barriers for people in the zero to thirty percent income AMI, and so Brooke, I'm gonna let you start talking about that. Um, like, who's being served? Who needs? Um, who do we need to look at for the low, the lower income or zero income levels? And then um, how that all operates. Oh, let me, I'll pull up your slides here in a second. Say hello Great. and uh, say hello and then I'll pull up your slides. All right, hi everyone. Thank you all so much for the opportunity to be here today. Um, this is such a great conversation to have amongst colleagues um, passionate about affordable housing and in the spectrum of what uh, Christine mentioned, we have a, a very vast spectrum of the affordable housing context for folks that are extremely rent burdened, um, paying more than 30% of their income on rent. Um, but we also have a subset of folks that you know have no income um, are exiting institutional settings or have complex barriers to getting into housing so that way they can increase their income. Um, and so I'm going to center a, a bit on our, our conversation today about that population. Um, so we have just a little bit about who we are. If you have never heard of Corporation for Supportive Housing or CSH, uh, we're a national nonprofit organization. Um, we're based in, uh, we have uh, offices throughout the country, but essentially a lot of the work that we do is in community, working with systems, working with funders uh, to really advocate for supportive housing, which I'll, I'll kind of go over what that means and, and kind of the ingredients that based on the way that we explain it, but we provide training and education. We also do lending um, and policy reform because we really believe that a lot of the things that need to change at times happen at that legislative place um, to really um, impact how we can get people into housing. So what is supportive housing? Um, and so this is, this is an important component because 
these these are um, on the next slide. We really are trying to do uh, the heart work. And when I say heart work, this is the the work of us working to get folks off the street um, and into a permanent, affordable, and independent place that they can, um, you know thrive in, in a home. And when we talk about supportive housing, we have that affordable housing, right? So that's our affordable housing spectrum, the folks um, that we work with in affordable housing. We want a, a unit that folks can afford, uh, again, where they're not paying more than 30% of their income. And then we've got, you know, the, the, the spectrum of the services that, that go with it. Um, and the people that are in supportive housing are, are folks that, you know, we engage with on a daily basis. These are our community members. These are our, our, um, our folks in our communities. And uh, Christine mentioned that 100,000 folks that, that are probably severely rent burdened um, and on that spectrum in the affordable housing space. And when we talk about supportive housing, there's about 8,000 Nevadans that fall into this category of needing intensive services plus an affordable place to be housed. Um, and so these are, are folks that, you know, may have multiple barriers to accessing housing. They might have mental health conditions coupled with a substance use disorder, or they could be somebody that has a background um, in the justice system that may be impacting them even getting access to a home because of a conviction that occurred years ago. Um, it could be veterans that are, um, you know, may be suffering from a mental health condition and, and can't get access into a home. We have a, um, a large transition age youth population in Nevada uh, that is um, experiencing homelessness. Um, and so young people that, you know, may have no credit at all or no income that need a supportive housing option. Um, and our seniors, we have a, a large aging population and a tourist retirement state like ours in Nevada um, of folks that are on fixed incomes and may only have their social security um, or disability income. And when you look at the, the rising um, of folks that, that have you know the debilitating health conditions or maybe onset um, uh, dementia or some of the, the, the other things in, that aging can bring in addition to having low income, these are the folks that we need to, we need to catch and get into a supportive housing option. So why supportive housing? Um, and, you know, the, it's, this is an evidence-based practice. This is not something that we've just thought of as a good idea. And um, we hear a lot about you know, it being an expensive intervention, but it's also actually more expensive for us to not have an intervention to get people off of our streets, um, to help, you know, health, uh, housing is healthcare. We've seen that with the COVID-19 pandemic and how just taking people off the streets, getting people out of congregate shelters um, and putting them in a place where they can stabilize and recover from this, this um, pandemic, ha we've shown what a home can do for somebody's health. And the evidence has, has shown that folks stay housed and, and people thrive when they are in housing. Um, and so we've got, you know, examples here. Um, we are amongst our architects in the room. And so we wanted to also elevate the fact that um, the design features are really something that we are emphasizing in supportive housing. The way in which we design, um, you know, homes for families, the way we design homes for seniors and for people with intellectual disabilities. There's quality elements that need to be embedded um, when we think about supportive housing. And so thinking about folks having a private bathroom and kitchen, a place to cook so they can have healthy meals, access to space, um, and adequate bedrooms as well. Um, and, you know, if it's a family unit, having enough bedrooms. And so these are the things that we think about uh, in supportive housing. And we actually had a great example of the San Anderson Apartments, and this is actually out of Denver, Colorado, where they have a trauma-informed single-site um, development that is focused on the population that, that we're talking about. Folks that have been cycling in and out of the justice system, out of emergency rooms, they have a dedicated development, 100% dedicated to this population, and it's a trauma-informed design feature. Um, and we had an opportunity to, to get access to them to do a presentation um, uh, and some evaluation that was done on their projects, and they have seen some significant outcomes for this population where folks have stayed housed for um, over a five-year period, 95% of the tenants have stayed housed. Um, and um, the slides that you're seeing on your screen 
are examples of this development from the architect that put it together. Um, you can kind of see, how, you know, the beautiful de design features, the ways in which they brought the outside space inside with different green features and outdoor spaces and large hallways and just things that, that really are helpful when somebody may be experiencing a traumatic experience um, where they can feel safe in, in their home. Um, and so this is just some lessons learned at the end uh, that they experienced kind of developing this unit, but I'll stop there and, and pass it back to you, Monica. Thanks, Brooke. Okay, are we back? We're back. Thank you. Okay, I appreciate that. So, you know, we've already, I've already said a couple of times um, that we have some constraints dealing with finances and funding and how do we, how do we bring all of that together? Uh, and, and we discovered that more, if you've been on the affordable housing committee, if you were in the subcommittee where we dealt with finances, you know that was a huge burden as we were trying to figure all of that out. Um, in July, um, Dr. Hillary Lopez came in and spoke to um, our group about um, how all this funding comes together. Um, trying to trying to help um, architects understand what our place is um, when we're dealing with some of that. So Hillary's going to talk a little bit um, about um, the you know what our limitations are, a little bit on demographics. Um, I think you're also going to talk a little bit about the QAP maybe, and then um, maybe how we how we all are working together or how we're not working together. Um, so Hillary Lopez. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I just uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity to come back and talk with the group again. And um, some of the information may be similar to what was previously presented, but bears repeating. Um, and, you know, as Monica said, I just want to take a few moments to talk about kind of funding and, and some of the funding constraints and you know, just kind of reiterate that uh, affordable housing projects are complex. And um, the projects that we work on, they really require multiple layers of funding in order to um, make them work from a financing standpoint. And so it's not uncommon for these projects to have uh, either 9% low-income housing tax credits uh, or 4% in tax exempt bonds uh, financing, as well as then um, a layer of uh, federal home funding from a local jurisdiction or in our case, uh, in the balance of counties here in Nevada from the state of Nevada housing division, um, affordable housing trust funds through the state of Nevada. And if it's a project that uh, is aimed at um, the populations that Brooke was talking about and can serve extremely low income households to have some national housing trust funds also as a layer of financing. And then to fill any remaining gaps in funding with a, additional sources such as federal home loan bank, affordable housing program funds or private foundation um, funding. So, you know, it, it takes a lot of time and resources to assemble the financing and then to structure it in a way where we're not only meeting the financing requirements of the project, but also all of the regulatory requirements that go along with each of these different financing sources. Um, and even with all of that, what I will say is that unfortunately, um, there is always more demand for funding than a supply of funds available. And so there is a continuously competition for these limited resources in order to make these projects move forward. And um, typically what that means is that there are some really good projects that either have to wait to move forward until the next funding cycle, or unfortunately don't move forward because there's just not enough uh, resources available. And um, one thing I will also say, and I had mentioned this on, on the last uh, session is that Many of these projects, when we're talking about the need for affordable housing, everybody wants the housing available tomorrow because we all know how pressing the need is. 
But unfortunately, it takes time to go and assemble all of these layers of financing that I was mentioning. And so from conceptual design until the time that the project actually closes on its financing and starts construction could be anywhere from about um, on the on the shorter end, six months to typically closer to a year um, to assemble all of this financing and then get to a point where you could close on all of this financing and move into construction. Um, a couple of the constraints that we have are that, especially um, on the 9% low income housing tax credit side, uh, we're really constrained in the amount of tax credits that we have available. And the amount of tax credits is uh, set. It's based on a formula at the federal level, which is tied to state population. And as a smaller state, we get a smaller allocation of 9% tax credits. And this program is what we call our boutique program. So it's typically the funds um, that are being used for the projects that can deeply target. So these projects are usually 40 to 60 units, and they're targeting households at or below 50% of area median income. So in a typical year, based on the amount of 9% credits that we have available, uh, the state is usually funding about five to seven projects. So if you assume an average of about 50 units, you know, we're talking about somewhere between three and 400 units a year. So definitely not enough on its own to kind of move the needle and get our state where we need to go. We also have what's called the 4% low income housing tax credit that's paired with tax exempt bond financing. And that is um, more of our workforce housing uh, program. And those projects tend to be larger, typically between about 150 to 300 units in a project and aimed at populations with incomes more around 50 to 60% of area median income. Um, and so those uh, address more of a workforce housing need. Um, one thing I will say is that we were successful as an industry in getting the federal government to enact legislation which fixed the 4% low income housing tax credit rate at 4%, which allows those projects to generate more tax credits, which in turn then uh, raises more private equity that's invested into those projects and leverages funds further. So that was great news. Um, the other thing is our state affordable housing trust fund is tied to our real estate transfer tax. So in years where Nevada has a really hot real estate market, that fund is very successful in economic downturns there is less available in that funding stream. And so it fluctuates from year to year. Uh, the other thing that I will say is just in terms of other sources like Federal Home Loan Bank, then we're competing against projects in other states as well. So there's no guarantee of receiving those funds. So all of this is to say really that it is hard. It's hard work. It's a labor of love to assemble the financing and, um, and work to get these projects, uh, the sources that are required in order to move them forward. That said, there are some really exciting opportunities uh, within Nevada uh, recently. And so I wanted to kind of touch on those. One is what Christine mentioned, is that we were successful in getting a transferable state tax credit and having some revisions to that in the last legislative session, which will allow it to work better for affordable housing projects. And so this is really the first new source of funding within our state for affordable housing. And um, we'll be talking more about it at the upcoming a conference to learn more about how it will be rolled out, how folks could access it uh, and use it in their projects, but it's just extremely exciting to have this new source of funds. 
Another opportunity that's on the horizon is the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco is working to develop a Nevada specific fund, which will enable Nevada based projects to compete um, more successfully for some of their affordable housing program funds. Uh, we anticipate that that fund will be rolled out within the next year or so. They are still at the beginning of that, but that's another exciting opportunity. In Southern Nevada, there is the Southern Nevada Public Management Lands Act, which is a federal legislation that allows for um, the local jurisdictions to work with the federal government to get uh, low cost land and use that for affordable housing. And I think Lori is gonna touch upon that. It's a little bit of a double-edged sword because it does provide low cost land, which is great for affordable housing projects, but it also has some regulatory hurdles um, that need to be addressed as well for the, the projects to, to move forward. Um, the other thing that I mentioned was the fixing of the 4% low-income housing tax credit rate, and that's been great because it's allowed more tax-exempt bond projects to move forward, and um, that also is a double-edged sword because we definitely need those projects, and there had been a period of time where bond projects just weren't financially feasible, and so to have this uh, magnitude of bond projects moving forward is very exciting and will create um, a large number of units um, throughout the state. But the double-edged sword is that um, it also, there's a lot of demands on our volume cap in Nevada. And so we're getting uh, closer to a situation where volume cap may become um, more competitive than what we've seen in the past. The other thing is that countrywide, because there are so many bond projects that now have uh, come off the shelf because of feasibility, that from a private investor standpoint, it is allowing investors to kind of cherry pick projects more. Um, so there are some other worthy projects that uh, are less enticing because they're harder projects for investors. And it's also in some ways helping kind of keep uh, pricing soft. So um, hopefully over time though, that will kind of even out and stabilize. The other just piece that I wanted to mention that Monica touched upon was our state qualified allocation plan. And so I think that's a really important way that folks can engage across the state and have input into uh, affordable housing and the type of housing that we need and that the state um, will look to fund. And the qualified allocation plan really sets the rules for uh, projects that compete for the 9% low-income housing tax credits. And so it's very important for folks to provide input into that process so that this way, one, from a policy perspective, the funds are geared towards the type of projects that really address the, the needs of our community, but also so that um, we have input into other other um, factors that impact the costs or ability to do these projects. Um, and then finally, I think I just wanted to say that, you know, we are very lucky. I, I say this over and over again. I feel like we're very lucky that we live in a state where we have access to our funders, where uh, state staff, local staff are very engaged in the process and work closely with developers and really want to work with developers to make these projects move forward. Um, and so there is a lot of collaboration. Uh, that said, you know, we could always benefit from even further collaboration. Um, and so you know, I think that uh, as we move forward, it would be great also if we could um, continue to work with our funders so that this way 
we could try and assemble resources or funders can try and assemble resources and then um, put out an RFP or a package of those resources to developers that would help cut the time um, that it takes to assemble the financing to put these projects together and really cut down some of the risk associated um, with trying to gather those resources as well. So it would increase the probability of getting the projects moving and getting them moving faster. So um, that's just a little bit of a, of a touch on um, some of the financing and some of the opportunities and challenges that we have here in our state. But like I said, I think that we are um, lucky that we have a lot of collaboration and a lot of exciting things on the horizon for affordable housing. Thanks, Hillary. So I appreciate that. So next we have Lori Murphy. Um, Lori, I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the, how the QAP um, affects developers um, as you're getting into this whole um, working together kind of concept and the RFP that um, Hillary also alluded to. Thanks, Monica. And thank you everybody for having me here. And I really think that this is great. Um, I like the fact that the AIA is supporting affordable housing and um, Hillary made a great point. It would be really good to have some participation in the QAP hearing. So if anybody wants to join, um, to, to, it's open to the public and it would be great. Um, the, as Hillary mentioned, the QAP, she, she focused on the 9% deals, which is the competitive deals. And there, um, the QAP sets kind of the parameters that everybody has to do in order to win. Because since it's so competitive, you have to maximize your points. So basically everything in the QAP will be built. So if they say um, they're awarding points for solar panel, panels, for example, everybody will put solar panels. Um, and some of the things that they award points for, we don't think are, um, are always the best for, for the project. So um, we're trying to push, we're trying to convince them to use um, for, for example, on energy, um, um, a nationally recognized program uh, like they do for HUD deals, um, like LEED or Enterprise or one of those green um, building, et cetera. But um, so in, in addition to kind of uh, setting the way a project's built, they also sometimes increase the costs because um, you're not always choosing the most cost-effective things, but you have to do them in order to meet um, either the threshold requirements or win all the points. And it's more of a problem with the 9% competitive deals, but it also comes into play with the 4% deals because you do have some threshold requirements. Um, in terms of the um, RFP collaboration that Hillary was mentioning, um, that's something that is a, a great idea because um, we not only does it take time putting the funding together, but it adds uncertainty. Developers don't really know what funding is available. And so some available developers will be very aggressive when putting together a package, while others might be more conservative, only including um, funding that they know they can get. And so if the developers, if the funders would get together in the beginning and say, um, for this RFP, we're going to have $2 million in this kind of funding and a and, um, million dollars in this kind of soft funding and, and um, et cetera, then the developers would know these are the resources I have and I'm going to build, um, apply for the best possible project using those resources. And it would level the playing field in terms of the application. Um, as Hillary mentioned, save some time in the long run and, um, and also um, take a little bit of the uncertainty away from the project itself. Um, and so um, um, I work for a for profit developer who also does affordable housing. We partner with a nonprofit group to um, co-develop these non these affordable housing projects 
And so um, we are familiar with a lot of the constraints as a developer that a market rate developer does, but kind of even on steroids, I guess. So for example, um, one of the biggest things, challenges we have is zoning. And um, uh, I think as architects, you're all probably familiar with the NIMBY problem. Um, every apartment project that we try and get zoned, we um, have a fight from the single family homeowners around us. But imagine on top of the, the problems with apartments, now we're saying we're bringing low income housing to your area. And we find that low income housing seniors is hard, but low income housing for family where there's kids involved is even harder. And then when you start talking about the, the projects that Brooke is trying to support that bring in even further um, disadvantaged people, you get even more of a um, more pushback. And so that's one of the biggest hurdles that we have in um, developing projects. And um, one of the possible solutions that we've spoken to some of our local um, officials about is kind of pre-zoning in plan unit developments, setting aside certain areas for affordable housing, certain parcels for affordable housing um, development, and also just you know, having our commissioners um, be a little bit more um, in gutsy and do a better job of education. And so um, Monica just put up some slides um, of some of our affordable housing projects. And um, we really need to make the community understand that just because it's low income doesn't mean it's an institution. They, a lot of people think of public housing, but we really put together some beautiful projects. Um, this, these are some the interior common areas um, and the exterior, and these are um, the units, some of the units, but the exteriors are gorgeous as well. In fact, in um, many of the communities where we develop our projects, um, our um, apartment communities are nicer looking than the houses that surround them. And um, Monica, I don't know if you have any pictures of the, the aerials, um, but if not, we'll, we'll just go on with it. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have those in here. Okay, that's great. Um, so um, the, the other thing um, that, that a developer faces um, besides the NIMBY problem, um, we have to deal with affordability. Hillary mentioned all the layers of financing and what we're also running into at the same time is increases in costs. So the more um, land, when land increases, when lumber increases, when, when everything else increases, it just makes those gaps in funding worse. And so um, we have to get more and more creative with our projects. And um, unfortunately, one of the things that happens sometimes is we have to build smaller projects um, in order to have enough funding to cover them. But that's a vicious cycle because when you build a smaller project, you lose economies of scale. So um, when in, in the economies of scale um, enter into kind of two parts of the, the economics of a deal. First, the cost. Um, as you saw, we have a lot of common areas in our projects. And so when you have a small number of units, you're um, splitting the cost of those common areas among fewer units. So, um, uh, and there's also things like legal expenses and um, uh, architect fees and um, cost of issuance and other things that are that don't vary a lot with the size of the project. So when you have a smaller project, you end up your per unit cost ends up going up. That's also true when you talk about operation, the operations of a project. And I know, you know, this is finance and um, uh, it's a little difficult to understand, but the reason we need so much soft money is because in a market rate project, 
you usually put a big loan on, on the um, project and you pay for that loan by charging high rents. So the high rents cover the cost of the loan and all of your operating expenses. In these projects, what we do is we bring in equity through the tax credits and soft money that Hillary described as that financing stack. So we don't have to have a big loan. And we also get um, property tax abatement. And all that is to bring down the operating costs because the lower the operating costs, the more we can bring down the rents. But again, when you have a small project, there are some fixed costs that you can't spread among very many units. And examples of those are, you know, uh, leasing staff. You need, you always need a maintenance guy and a leasing guy and a manager. Um, and so um, you might be able to um, spread, um, have that in a 50 unit project, you, you've got the same amount of people as you might have in a 100 unit project. And um, advertising, um, audit costs, there's a lot of examples, your pool maintenance, et cetera. A lot of example of fit, fixed costs. So um, when you're building small projects, your cost per unit goes up and it makes it, it's a, a bit of a vicious cycle, makes it a little harder to pencil. So, um, uh, and the 9% deals where we have such limited resources, that's one of the bigger problems there. And so we're hoping that having some additional soft funds from the ARP funds that um, Christine mentioned, that will that'll help us just bringing in additional funding will help with some of those issues. Um, so um, just again, as a developer, we've got to pull all the, it is very complex as everybody's mentioned, we've got to pull all these things together. And one of the biggest challenges we have is uncertainty. And um, the uncertainty for one thing, we don't know if we're gonna win. Um, there, a lot of these projects are competitive. And then even once we do win, the timing can sometimes be very uncertain. Um, and if you can imagine a market rate developer might have, and we, we are market rate, we have a pipeline of projects. We figure we're gonna build three, four projects a year. So we, we staff up, you know, whether it's our, our planning, our pre-development um, group or our construction teams, we're able to staff up well in, you know, in advance. We look out three, four, five years at, at our pipeline. When it comes to affordable housing, we don't know. We don't know when the RFPs are coming out. If they come out, we don't know if we're gonna win. Um, and um, so we never know how many of those projects we're gonna have. And then even when we do um, have those, we win those projects, the timelines sometimes slip a lot more than expected. Um, an example, um, two examples. One, we just um, submitted an RFP in July for a project and we were supposed to hear in August or September and we're still waiting. Um, and the bigger issue, um, Hillary mentioned the, um, it's SNIPLMA, the acronym, the Southern Nevada Manage, Plans Management Act, where it's a great program. The BLM gives discounted land to, um, the, uh, to developers who are building affordable housing, 95% discount. So we can make some, um, make uh, projects pencil and target deeper. And we won um, a project um, two years ago and we've been working with the BLM and we have about a year and a half more to get through the BLM process before we can even start construction. And when we first were awarded the project, we figured it would be an 18 month to two year timeline. And um, for various reasons, um, the timeline has slipped so much and um, it just makes it very difficult for a developer to, to, to plan. Um, so um, the other timing issues uh, that we run into are, uh, I'm sure you've, you're very well aware um, through the entitlement process, um, that process has gotten more challenging recently. I think um, COVID 
um, having the, the jurisdictions have to switch to electronic um, started some of it. Uh, and then of course, they had some layoffs when we thought that we were gonna have budget shortfalls because of the pandemic. And um, the timeframes are taking longer. And they've also changed some of their processes and that are making it uh, more difficult for developers. And one of them, just as an example, is the zoning process here in locally in Clark County. We used to, as soon as we were ready to zone, get to, to take a project to zoning, we would um, apply, we, we would look at when the dates, um, the hearing dates were, and we'd kind of back into it that, you know, okay, we need to do our neighborhood meetings and, and go to town board and all these things. And, and um, then we, we would um, have a package submit and we'd set a date early on. Now they've changed it so they want you to have your package, your plans reviewed and your package reviewed before they can even set a date. So that not only adds time, but it also again adds uncertainty. You don't really know when you're gonna be able to go to the Board of County Commissioners. And besides making that more difficult for a developer to plan, the sellers get impatient in a hot land market where we are now, a lot of times the sellers, we like to know we can get a project zoned. That's part of our due diligence requirement before we buy the land. And it just um, makes it more difficult to get a seller who's willing to wait. And sometimes we have to pay more for that privilege. So um, the, the other thing I just um, wanted to talk about, um, I guess on the positive side, um, the ARP funds are very exciting that um, Christine mentioned. And um, we're thinking that with those funds, we're going to be able to do larger projects. Some of the, I think those funds will go a long way in, in helping us solve some of the issues. Uh, we'll be able to do larger projects. We'll be able to target deeper on some of our large projects. You know, Hillary mentioned their workforce housing, but with some soft money, we might be able to include some lower income units um, and make some projects feasible that wouldn't have been feasible otherwise. So, um, and, um, Included in the package there, um, Christine's recommendation was for some money to cover um, the services and um, the operating expenses on some of the really small permanent supportive housing projects that um, Brooks Group um, needs. So um, we're pretty excited about that and really hoping that um, the funds will come through and we'll be able to get it done. Thanks, Lori. Um, real quick before I go on to, I see we got a couple of questions in the chat before we go to those. Um, because you, we, we kind of touched on NIMBY before and you kind of touched on it today. Um, recently, I guess we've a lot of us have been following what's going on in um, southern part of the valley, southwest part, um, along Cactus and Mountain's Edge. And I'm only talking about it because it's like a half mile, mile and a half from my neighborhood. Um, but there's a big uproar about this affordable housing going into uh, Mountain's Edge. I, I don't see it as a problem, um, but a, a lot of people seem to be against it. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how we um, help the public um, understand that affordable housing doesn't take down their the value of their homes. Like any, any pointers from uh, you, Lori, or anyone else? Well, um, I can tell you that what we usually do is we show pictures of our projects. We invite people to come visit our projects um, because they're gorgeous. Um, and um, we, we've had in the city of Henderson, by the way, is very good at helping us through some of those meetings. And we've cited crime statistics and traffic statistics and school statistics because the, a lot of the concerns are, our crime rates gonna go up, um, you know, um, our uh, schools are overcrowded and traffic. And so, so um, we, we work with the local jurisdiction sometimes to get statistics that show that that's not the case in, um, in, in communities. Um, and it's just really a matter of education 
And um, although I'll tell you, no matter um, how hard we try, there are there are often people who just won't, um, just don't want it. And um, and, and um, then at, at that point, it's up to the commissioners or the council people to basically say, if you don't have a good reason to oppose this and you know, just not wanting affordable housing is not a good reason, then it's you know, a matter that the, our local jurisdiction needs to stand up and support the housing. Yeah, I appreciate that. The other thing about that is you, you need to have access to um, transportation. Like if you're going to build, because the county is is supporting that, or the commissioners seem to be supporting uh, that construction for that affordable housing on Cactus. Um, but um, RTC has recently started running buses down there. So that's a good thing too, if people have the difficulty um, driving or if they don't have a car. Um, so I think that would be another thing to be concerned about. And I think Brooke kind of touches on some of that stuff in her work as well, right? Um, and where we place housing, um, whether it's infill or if it's um, suburbanly, suburbanly, remotely located, I guess. Um, so I'm, a couple of questions um, from Kimberly. Are there any particular regions in Las Vegas, in the Valley, that are more amenable to affordable housing? Because I think you already, uh, Lori already talked about um, acquisition, um, like BLM land a little bit, um, but we do have some other um, lands occasionally available from local government, right? So, um, and I'll just kind of jump in. So uh, typically the, the land that's been made available has been through the Southern Nevada Public um, Management's Land Act uh, for some of the larger bond projects, and I know Ovation as well as Nevada Hand has have uh, taken advantage of um, of that land when it's become available. We are starting to see uh, throughout the state um, government agencies uh, identifying other lands that may be made available through an RFP process uh, for redevelopment or for development um, at lower cost for affordable housing. And so that's also like a great step forward um, for affordable housing on its development. So are there better areas um, to let me see, uh, I'll try that again. So where might we find uh, some of this public land? Um, are there more, are there areas that um, would be better suited for the affordable housing that um, where, the, where the, the land is already um, owned by the public entity? Maybe that's where we're going with that. So um, BLM land is all over Southern Nevada. Um, there, there are some infill pieces and there are some um, out in, in like West Henderson has quite a bit of BLM land and there aren't any services nearby. Um, so there's kind of two things um, that we look for when we're looking for land for affordable housing. Um, one is we want it to be near ser services or like you mentioned the bus route and the area that you're talking about, we actually have a project not far from there and when we built it, there wasn't a bus route, but we we're very excited that there will be one. So um, close to services, grocery stores, buses, et cetera, is very important. Um, but the other thing, this is a, a little bit of a technical issue, but there's something called a small area DDA. Um, there's zip codes where you actually get 30% more tax credits if the projects are located in those zip codes. And it's the zip codes are put out by HUD, and they're not there aren't very many of them. And um, we usually try to to build in those areas if possible, but there are so few that it's very difficult to find land there um, that that's ready to develop that's not out in the boonies. So, um, but the only other thing I do want to say um, when you're talking about where projects should be located. We believe, we in at Ovation, not every developer does, but we believe in um, that these projects should be spread throughout the valley in moderate to um, slightly higher income areas. We do not believe in building um, these 
communities in low income areas because we, we want to avoid the concentration of poverty and also because the rents are already low there and it does it makes it hard to get a loan. Um, we want to build these projects kind of um, dispersed throughout the community and that's very important to us. So and Brooke, how does that affect mental health when we're talking about where we build those communities? Because if we're talking about building in a low income area versus a median or um, higher income area, that's a totally different um, perspective from the person living there, right? Yeah, it's such a great question. Um, you know, this community is, a, is an element of quality supportive housing that we focus on. And if there's a unit in a, in a community that is thriving, where there is access to grocery stores, place of worship for folks to go, or you know, an economic uh, places for people to, to have access to to employment, that's where we see people thrive. Um, and so, you know, when we have developments that are in areas where, they, where there's not that access, or or you know, areas where there might be a strong concentration of poverty or drug trafficking, and we're trying to help somebody that is trying to recover from a substance use disorder, well, now we're just putting them in, in a very temptatious type of environment, right? So I think having this, as, as Lori mentioned, you know, places throughout the community, integrated in community where folks aren't othered and, and put outside of, um, you know, the, the general public, that is the best practice that we see. Right, and so also uh, from Anna, she's asking about how important the exterior common areas and the overall value um, is for these developments. Is it, you know, what's the value to the occupants? What's the value to the neighborhood? That might also be one of those um, NIMBY deterrents or educational factors, yeah? I guess that's really like a, a Brooke and Lori question. If you wanna talk a little bit about exteriors on buildings and how that integrates into um, neighborhoods. So um, I'll tell you one, one, it, one comment we get a lot when we're zoning is um, balconies. Um, the neighbors don't like balconies because they feel that um, the residents are going to um, look into their yards. But, um, and so um, we typically only put balconies on the interior courtyards and, and not um, where there's uh, on property lines where there's single family homes on the other side, or we, at least we try and minimize them. Um, but we do things like um, stepped uh, developments. So um, we're doing four story buildings. We haven't gone above four stories because the costs are much higher when you go from four to five. But so um, if we have a four story development, it'll usually be four, three, and two, where the two story is the closest to the single family homes. So um, they, and we're always sensitive to the line of sight issue. Um, these are things that planners often look for um, to make sure that um, we, you know, that, that there's, not, it's not too intrusive to the residents nearby. And then um, in terms of the exterior, one of the things that we do in our community, we put a lot of landscaping. Um, we do a lot, we do um, a lot of architectural features. We do very simple buildings in order to keep the cost down, but um, we do uh, awnings and pop-outs and um, uh, different color, um, uh, schemes and um, et cetera um, to, to make the, the building interesting and even, you know, the layout of the building. Um, so it's not just one long building, but um, different sheet, different, um, we, we call them E-shapes or, you know, U-shapes. So there's interior courtyards and, and just different uh, pleasing features in the site plan. Okay, I seem to have uh, missed it with Anna there. So she is talking about specifically the landscape spaces. I know that she's also interested in how um, landscaping affects you mentally. Um, so maybe Brooke needs to talk about that one a little bit because it is important, right? Like how we experience, I mean, I need landscaping in my yard just to um, kind of decompress sometimes too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so this was um, some of the slides that we showed uh, based on the population that we're serving. Uh, we find that, you know, seniors, for example, a senior development, uh, you know, having a community garden where there's a place where folks can go and have that opportunity to, to 
grow their own vegetables and have, you know, a, a sense of community outside um, shows really well, right? And the Sanderson apartments, actually, they had something that they learned from their particular development, because it's single individuals that live here, was that nobody used the outdoor space there as far as the garden. The garden had been developed yet. There wasn't like a, a tenant committee that took that ownership there as of yet. Um, but, you know, just having some elements of the outdoor space inside was also really important for this development because folks were so used to living outside, living out in the streets that they actually wanted to make sure that inside that there was green features and green um, designs and wood paneling that really brought that outdoor space inside to, to, to address mental health and, and trauma-informed design features. Well, and, you know, just to add to, I think that um, it's important to note that this is really something that the developers think about um, for these projects. Like, we don't want to create just an, uh, a community where it's just surrounded by asphalt. So, and there's also points that are awarded for doing things like community gardens, or outdoor barbecue areas or uh, horseshoe pits or other kind of outdoor amenities so that this way uh, there are those opportunities for the residents to, um, to be outdoors and to also um, interact with their fellow residents in these areas. So that is something that's important on these projects. It's important to create those spaces. And depending upon the type of project, then there's thought given to um, what amenities make the most sense by the developers as well. So in things like supportive housing, looking at what type of amenities for the population that's being served make the most sense in senior housing, looking at, you know, are there uh, walking paths that that could be uh, part of the, the project that allow for, um, for some exercise for the residents that are, that are in that community. Are there opportunities that um, would allow children and family properties to, to play together? Those types of things. How are the properties um, uh, organized so that those with disabilities could also take part in all of those amenities that are associated with the property. So it's definitely something that is important and that, um, you know, developers work with their architects to incorporate those elements. Thanks, those are really great points. Um, and just to hop back over to uh, something that Lori picked up on, or Lori mentioned was um, not building within um, already low-income neighborhoods because Kathy Thomas Gibson from the city of Las Vegas commented that, and she said, public entities are actually discouraged by HUD from concentrating low-income housing uh, in lower in those lower-income communities. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to see that they also um, appreciate that we don't want to do that. And then Christine, uh, what did you say? We have, oh yeah, we have the California Yimby, yes, in my backyard um, for um, the plenary, the opening session um, at the conference next week. So that's very cool. I've mm -hmm. um, been seeing a little bit of that um, more recently. Um, let's see, what about um, like CLT? So community land trust, can, how do, can we use those or is that gonna start to help us in developing better, more um, affordable housing? And how do we actually start those CLTs? That's part of the task force um, comments that we came up with, right? Or ideas, not comments. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Monica. I'll just real quickly, I actually have Jean Diaz from St. Joseph Community Land Trust on that opening plenary as well. And I moderated a session at the Planners Association with him. They absolutely can play a role. Uh, pretty exciting. You know, Nevada statute does allow even um, for our local governments, jurisdictions to um, contribute land that could go to a land trust. Um, and land trusts, um, for everybody's knowledge, really are an amazing way to have lasting affordability. So with the tax credit properties, they do expire. Now, ideally, we're rehabbing those properties and keeping them affordable. But a land trust, you're typically looking at a renewable 99-year lease on affordable properties. And where we, and they're run by you know, nonprofits. 
So um, they're mission driven, of course. And where we typically see them in affordable housing is around home ownership. And we actually have the um, Community Foundation of Northern Nevada is currently developing a 20 home townhome property up here in Northern Nevada. And it's on a land trust. They actually have a land trust arm. So that's typically we think of affordable home ownership. But Gene's going to talk about where land trust can actually come in. And it, I could listen to him all day. I mean, there's so much to learn with what land trust can do. And they really can be molded to a community. So the land trust, for example, in Tahoe that he works with, I mean, he's serving also 0 to 30% AMI and managing multifamily on his land trust. So additionally, there's a land trust in San Diego that they provide technical assistance to homeowners to actually go through the ADU permitting process because they consider that as an opportunity to increase um, affordability in home ownership. So land trusts are really, are really flexible. They can look a lot of different ways, but in Nevada, it's an opportunity. And uh, we have two in Northern Nevada active, one in Tahoe, St. Joseph Community Land Trust, and of course the Northern Nevada Community Foundation. Uh, the Nevada Rural Housing Authority actually has a land trust infrastructure in place. So, and um, as part of our task force recommendations, we're recommending $50 million of that $500 million be set aside and, and developed to be used for um, land investments to help affordable housing projects so that Lori can come build some awesome affordable housing on land and we help remove that barrier and just mitigate the cost and uncertainty in development. So now I have a twofold question. Well, it's, it, they don't, they're not really related, but they are both related to CLTs. One is, when are we gonna start doing that here in Southern Nevada? And two, um, have, you had any, have you seen any pushback from planners or um, local jurisdictions on CLTs? I know we've had these conversations um, on lower levels in, um, uh, in some of the local jurisdictions, but I'm wondering, if you've had any feedback on how um, maybe commissioners or council people um, are looking at CLTs, how they feel about them. Are they a go? And are we doing them down here? There we go. There are my questions again. So I'll just quickly and everybody else can weigh in, but I can tell you there's a lot of interest and a lot of interest in Southern Nevada in land trusts in my circles. And people are wondering why we don't have one yet. Why aren't we doing this yet? And I really think, you know, next week's conference, not because I want to promote the conference, but to me, it's the opportunity to convene and it'll be in person in Las Vegas because that's the energy that's going to start it, right? Having Gene on that opening plenary because it is expensive, affordable housing. And the opening plenary is what we can do beyond money, right? How a land trust can contribute. One of the most important tools for affordable housing development that's allowed by statute in Nevada is inclusionary zoning. Not saying we have to do that. Maybe it doesn't match our communities, but if it does match our communities, one successful way to do it is by partnering with a land trust. So land trust can partner with um, private sector to help main, uh, to help attract the tenants that would be low income where, you know, a builder's like, hey, that's not my thing. At the same time, they can support a local government to track those low income units that might not have the capacity to do it as well, right? So really just playing that part. But Monica, I think we're at that time, um, I'm pretty new to the coalition a year and a half and I didn't come here to talk about affordable housing. I'm expecting us to get it done. So are you gonna lead the land trust, Monica? <laughs> Here's my question for you. I really, you know, who on this room, who on this call in this webinar is going to lead the land trust because it's going to be community driven, but the time is now. You know, I'm looking at the names here on the participants and I'm thinking, hmm, how do we do that? Yeah, so I, I think that's a really important thing um, that needs to get done. And, uh, and I, hope that, um, I hope that the conference next week uh, really spurs on some of those ideas. Um, oh, hello. Um, it's, uh, what was the other thing I was thinking about on that? Um, inclusionary zoning, conflict. I got all distracted about uh, getting put on the spot there. Um, so there's this other idea about uh, local state, local entities, federal, state, um, leading the effort um, to provide lasting affordable rentals. Um, and so how could we, um, how could these subsidies be retargeted towards the lower income renters? 
who's taking that? So, you know, I, I think that the issue is we have a lot of need in the state. Um, and, you know, there's, there's need amongst a variety of income groups um, and also between rental housing and uh, home ownership housing. So um, there's, there's just a, a lot of need. And I think that the exciting part is that there's a lot of resources becoming available. And, um, and with the coalition, uh, we've been able to really kind of uh, coalesce as an industry around kind of some policy objectives, around um, some collaborative efforts to kind of help everyone kind of move in the same direction. And, you know, that's been missing in our state for a while. And uh, I think that having the coalition now and having that kind of coalescence has really helped in kind of pushing the agenda forward, both at the state legislative level, at local levels as well, so that um, we are getting, um, moving the needle in the direction that we need to and really uh, looking at kind of, okay, from a policy perspective, what's kind of the most need, but how do we move in that direction without necessarily just, um, just avoiding um, some of the other need in our state. So how do we take kind of a balanced approach to really meet the, the competing needs for affordable housing from these different populations from different regions in our state and the different type of affordable housing that's, that's needed um, across our areas. So I think yeah. I'm thinking there is more, maybe that's more about like a, a, a oh, Brooke, what were you going to say? Go ahead. I was just going to um, echo, you know, the need to sort of, there is a huge need in the state, but I think the, the benefit of coming together and further coalescing resources um, from different jurisdictions, different state agencies, different philanthropy. There's so many resources that we aren't maximizing to the full extent of what those dollars can do. Um, and until we really have an op opportunity to do that coordinated NOFA, where we're supporting the efforts of our developers and the work by braiding these dollars and really maximizing that, we can target the priorities well, right? So I think having more of a dynamic conversation about maximizing our dollar to make it go longer. I don't know what that means. So are we, are, are you thinking um, bringing like whatever the city, the county and the state and maybe private investors have pooling that all in one place and then that gets dispersed or applied for and dispersed? I, I'm, I, you lost me there, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, that, I think that's exactly what I'm saying. If we had an opportunity to sort of pool resources um, and, you know, be able to kind of align the timing when those resources come out. So that way, when a developer does need to know that they wanna go after this resource, well, here's the operating dollars to support your operating. Here's the capital stack. And here are the services to wrap for the population if we wanna service those hardest to serve folks. Here are the service dollars all coming out in one concerted NOFA. So that way, then we all can leverage all of these dollars and prioritize the folks that, that we want to focus on to get housed based on the need, right? What is the data-driven need? What is our community's need? Let's focus there and, and really have a joint um, effort to, to address the need. Okay, so that would be um, like, here's the demographic, here's how it's all split up and who needs what. And then we put all the Okay, this is very simple. We put all the money into one pot, wherever it's coming from, and then everybody starts applying for that. So does that kind of thing work for a developer? Lori? Absolutely. Uh, we've seen oh. it work in King County, but yeah, go ahead. I get I get the one, I get the one place and you know where you're going for it, but I'm just wondering like then is that gonna work out for is everybody like happy about that? Like is the city happy about putting their money in and is um you know, is the private investor happy about putting their money in? I'm, so, Lori, that's a good thing for you, though, one place to go. Well, um, and I don't know, it, it probably wouldn't be the only place we'd go. Um, um, we'd still be, you know, we'd still have home funds and you still have, you know, federal home loan bank, but it would just be another source of a big pool of money that um, would have hopefully not as many strings attached because that sometimes you know, um, we run into issues, some of the 
funding requires, you know, um, trigger Davis-Bacon prevailing wages, which increase costs or things like that. But um, yeah, any any place where we have another source of soft funding um, makes it so you can target deeper. So um, so for every, you know, um, 50,000, let's say you put in to a project, you might be able to get some, you know, go from a 60% AMI unit to a, you know, a 40 or 50% AMI unit, you know, so um, you can um, target more deeply when you've got some soft funds. So yeah, a developer would always be happy about um, additional sources of soft money. Ah, uh -huh. so a pool over here for that kind of soft money and then other sources for the other hard costs or whatever, right? right. There's, yeah, they call it a stack because, okay. or lasagna, I've heard, <laughs> heard it referred to as lasagna. There's, in order to do any of these deals, you have several um, sources of funding on top of each other. And right. depending on, on the project. Right. Thank you for that uh, clarification. Anyone else have questions? Because I see that uh, it's almost seven o'clock and we're going to have to wrap up. I'm really surprised how quickly that went. Um, seemed like it was going to drag on forever when I was having issues in the very beginning. Or do um, any of the panelists have any questions for uh, that we can dole out there? That sounds like we're supposed to go to sleep there. <laughs> James, what you got? All right. Well, thank you, Monica. And really, thank you to all of our panelists tonight. I want to thank Christine, Hillary, Lori, and Brooke. Um, this really was an amazing discussion. And um, I think just even by all the, the questions we, we had in the last uh, few minutes and stuff, uh, there's obviously a lot of uh, interest. And hopefully, this is more interest of people um, willing to join the Affordable Housing Committee and, and meet with, uh, with us. So um, if there's any, anyone's looking for information, you can look on our website for that um, as well. I'm going to pull up my screen. Um, and somehow, we're, somehow we have to figure out how we're gonna start doing um, CLTs down here in Southern Nevada. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, as we wrap up this year, just want to highlight a couple upcoming events as well. Um, ne next week, we have our Allied Appreciation event um, at, on Wednesday, uh, uh, October 27th in the evening at the AIA office uh, downtown. So make sure to come out for that. Um, also, we are going to be having our AIA Nevada Design and Service Awards and the AIA Las Vegas holiday celebration on December 4th at the Four Seasons Resort. So please look for that, um, support your fellow members as well uh, as we celebrate the year and uh, awards for fantastic work that's being presented. So again, I wanna thank all of our panelists. I wanna thank Monica. Uh, this was a great presentation to be put together um, and just have a good evening, everyone. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, James. Thanks, Lori, Brooke, Hillary, Christine. Appreciate you guys uh, joining us tonight. Thanks for having us. Really enjoy it. Thank you all for joining us. Take care. Thanks. Have a good night. Good night. Am I supposed to stop?